Right. Uh, so I've been really excited about persistent data structures recently, and today I just mostly want to share with you how exciting they can be by showing you how to implement a couple. Um, I'm assuming that, like, actually, let's have a show of hands. Any closurians in the room? Figure that was most of you. Haskell? Represent. Have uh, we got any weirder languages like OCaml? Whoa, couple. Rust? That's a couple. That's good. Rust is going to be huge. Um, JavaScript. OK, good, because I'm going to be doing all my programming in JavaScript because I figure you can all read this. But I, I also want to make sure that you actually know about persistent data structures, and I don't need to explain to you why they're awesome, especially Clojureans in the room should know this very well, because Clojure gets a lot of focus on, on some pretty cool data structures, and, and we're actually going to be talking about them today. Um, so the focus of my talk was going to be the Bagwell tree. Uh, this is like one iteration down from what Clojure has in terms of the persistent vector. So I want to show you how to do the Bagwell tree eventually. I'm going to be mostly focusing on its, its predecessor, the thing that's in Clojure, but we're going to try and, and do both. And I want to try and, and explain to you why these two data structures are actually useful, why we can't just stick with const lists like, like McCarthy did. So um, in order to, to sort of make you see why we actually care about these data structures, we need to talk about complexity theory. Uh, in particular, we want to talk about the big O notation. So I'm going to give you, a, hopefully, a three-minute crash course in big O. Uh, so big O is, is sort of a way of, of, of talking about uh, the time complexity of an operation, how long uh, an operation is going to take to run. And it's all uh, in terms of relativity to the size of the data structure. And so, coming up first, uh, we have O1, which means that while it can still be an expensive operation, uh, the time, it, the, the amount of work it has to do is constant. It, it, the size of the data structure isn't affected by it. Um, and then there's linear time, which, which we um, write as ON which means that um, the amount of work you have to do is um, the same as the, the length of the, of the data structure. It's proportional to the length. And then we have logarithmic time, which is better than linear time, but not as good as constant time. Logarithmic time, you, you find that with trees, uh, mostly. It's, um, the operation is uh, logarithmic to the size of the data structure, which means that, say, if a data structure has length one, you have one, one unit of work. If it's length two, you have two units of work. If it's length four, you have three units of work. If it's length eight, you have four, four units of work, and so on. That's for log two, which is like a binary tree, the, a branching factor of two. Um, Clojure's vectors have a branching factor of 32, which gives us a log 32, usually. Uh, for logarithmic operations on it, which is actually pretty close to constant time in practice. So that's acceptable, while linear time usually is considered pretty bad. And those are the most important ones. That's th these are the ones we're going to be looking at today, mostly. There's, there's one more that you might see, which is O n log n, which is linear times logarithmic time. Um, and you usually don't see that unless you're dealing with things like sorting algorithms. Like uh, quicksort, uh, the worst case runtime of quicksort should be O n log n. And if your sorting algorithm is worse than that, then it's not very good. And then there's amortization, which is uh, the idea of, of spreading the cost of an operation over several operations. And the best example I can give you is by looking at this most basic of data structures. This is uh, my diagram of an array. Um, an array is, is just a consecutive bit of memory that contains a certain, a fixed number of, of um, 
elements, in this case, six of them, indexed from, oops, hi, <laughs> Twitter, indexed from zero to five. And something you might see, if, if you have looked at Rust at all, this is like the, the core list data type of Rust. This is um, what they call a vector, which is just an array pre-allocated, but um, it starts out empty, and you can fill it up until the, the capacity of it, at which point it will um, cause a reallocation of memory and, and copy all its contents over to a slightly bigger buffer. So if I want to append something to the end of this one, think of this as uh, an array of capacity of six, but with three elements already. If I want to append something to the end of this, what's the, uh, the, o, the, uh, the big O time of that? O1. Now, if I do this three times, it's still O1 for each. But then I hit the capacity when it starts to look like this. What is the cost of appending to the end now? It's ON, linear time. So what we're seeing here is, is uh, the idea of amortization. We call this amortized O1, which means that most of the time it's O1, but occasionally it's going to be a lot more expensive. And we consider that pretty acceptable as well for, for most data structures. So let's talk about my favorite data structure, the const cell. Now, Lisp's in the room know this one. Um, in Lisp, uh, it, it's sort of an array of, of, of size two, and you can put any value in each box, the left-hand side and the right-hand side box. But usually, it's, it's being used as a list, which means that the left-hand contains a value, and the right hand contains a pointer to the rest of the list. So that this is a list of two elements, Mike and Robert. So the first const cell contains Mike and a pointer to the const cell with Robert in it. The second const cell contains Robert and a null pointer, signaling that this is the end of the list. So the thing you do. Uh, the problem with this, obviously, is that you can't push things up to the end of this. It's going to be, you have to recreate the entire thing, at least if you want to stay immutable, and we do. So the way the console is usually used uh, is by consing things, cons, to the start. So if I want to say append uh, Joe to the start of the list, I simply create a new console with Joe in it and a pointer to the previous list. And what's the timing on that? Appending to front, that's O1, always. But appending to the end would be uh, linear time, and that's not good at all. And also lookup, incidentally, is linear time, because you have to walk through the entire thing, whereas with an array, lookup should be uh, constant time, because you just have to calculate the offset into the array. Right. So this is the console. Um, I think we've got time for the historical bit. I love this bit. So the, the, the console consists of, of two elements, traditionally called the car and the cutter. They're pronounced like that, car and cutter. And the reason for these names, I mean, they should be obvious, right? But let's just look at the etymology. This is the IBM 704 computer from sometime in the late 50s which is the first computer on which a Lisp interpreter was uh, implemented, or a Lisp compiler, quite possibly. And the names mean contents of address register and contents of decrement register. Obvious, right? Is there a slide for that? No. So the address register and, and the decrement registers were simply registers on the CPU of this giant beast. And these names stuck with us. They're actually in in languages like, like Scheme, they're still in uh, lists that are being used today. Whereas Clojure decided to, to rename it for some reason I cannot fathom. And the, the, the really cool thing about it is that the names compose. This is, oh, I love this. So basically, um, these are aliases you'll find in lists that actually still have the current gutter names. So Kada, that's the correct pronunciation, by the way, would be the car of the Kada which would be the second element of a list. The kadada, <laughs> the car of the kadder of the kadder, 
Oh, stop tweeting at me. I thought this would not display. <laughs> anyway, the car of the cudder of the cudder. That's the third element of the list, the cudder. And the cudder is the cudder of the cudder, which means uh, the list with the two first elements skipped. And the car is the car of the car, which, if we assume that we have a list of lists, would be the first element of the first list in the list. So that's perfectly obvious. Anyway, uh, most languages these days um, use the terms head and tail, whereas closure has gone with, what is it, first and rest? I remember my first closure program uh, I wrote, I actually did something like deaf car first and deaf cudder rest, <laughs> just so it would be more readable. Uh, just um, out of curiosity, what Pokemon is this? Tratini, very good. I have to check you. Can't claim to be Pokemon champions if you don't know this one. It's even first generation. Anyway, that was cons list. So let's talk about trees. Um, so uh, let's put in the room. Who's in this picture? John McCarthy. Cryptographers in this room. Who's in this picture? This is, I know this is complicated, but I'm having fun. That's Claude Shannon there on, on the, on the right, left. He basically invented cryptography, and unless Alan Turing did it, I'm not quite sure. Um, artificial intelligence researchers in the room. Who's in this picture? If I can remember the name of the guy. <laughs> Joseph something or other? Uh, he, he's a German-American, he was a German-American computer scientist who invented Eliza, also known as Doctor, the first, like, uh, chatbot in history. That's the guy on, on the right. He, I thought he looked so French, but it turns out he's actually German. But I want to talk about the last guy. He is Edward Fredkin. And he invented the term tree, spelled T-R-I-E, pronounced like tree, T-R-E, tree, which is a normal data structure. And a, a tree is a subset of a tree. This, we're having no problems with this, right? Um, the name comes from retrieval. Uh, because it's, it's a particular way of, of structuring a tree to make lookup easier. And that brings us to the hardest problem in computer science, naming. What the hell was he thinking? <laughs> I mean, it could have spelled it. I mean, it could have made it sound different, at least. Anyway, trees are prefix or radix-based search trees. And the simplest example, this isn't a diagram I stole off Wikipedia. Let's say you want to implement a, a, a map from strings to some value, in this case, numbers in blue. Um, if it's always going to be a string, we can do this very easily by actually just structuring the, the tree so that um, you, you take a character off the string in turn. So we start with the first character. Say we want to look up the word 10, or the key 10. Um, what we do then is, is we take the first character of 10, which is T, and we find a T in the top node, so we go to that part of the tree. And the next character is E, we find an E, so we get to the TE cell. And finally, the last character is, ten, is, is N, which takes us to the 10, and we find the value 12 there. And that, what is the time complexity of that? It should be logarithmic time, yes, log N. Obviously, it depends on the tree being balanced, which in this case, it probably isn't very. But still, it's uh, a lot more efficient than actually just walking through a, a list of associations. OK. This brings us to our actual data structures. Here is Phil Bagwell. Uh, he invented a data structure in the late um, 40s, which you might be familiar with if you've done any closure or any Scala. It's called a hash array map tree. Tree, as in T-R-I-E, tree, mind you. It's, it's called a HAMTS for short. 
which is actually something that I can pronounce without ambiguity, so I'm going to go with that. Um, this is the actual map from Clojure, and it is in the Scala Standard Library. As far as I know, I don't actually know Scala, but I've been told. Uh, we're actually not going to focus on that at all. We are going to focus on um, a related data structure, actually, this guy, whom some of you might be aware of. Um, well, obviously, he implemented the, the HAMPT in, in Closure Standard Library. And he also did something particularly clever for um, lists, or rather vectors. So Closure has two list-like data structures. It has the cons list, which I believe is called list. It's been so long since I've done Closure that I've actually started to forget. But I think list is the cons list. And vector, right? Or vec? That's um, the clever thing that he did. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, basically, he took the idea of the hash rate map tree and appropriated it for sequences. And this is sort of what it looks like. And the idea here is, is that you chunk up the actual number, um, the index that you're looking up, and um, into, into bits, a, a string of bits, say two bits or five bits. I think five bits is the, uh, the actual closure implementation. And you sort of do the same thing with the bits in that number that we did to the characters of the string previously. And so this is called, I believe Daniel Spivak was the first who tried to actually name it, because Rich just basically implemented it and the class the Java class in, in the Clojure compiler is called persistent vector, which isn't very descriptive. So Daniel Spiewak, I, I think it was, coined the term bitmapped vector tree. And it was also formalized. Uh, where did that go? I, I always forget this. I deliberately kept the tab open. Yes, uh, so this is Jean-Nicolas Lorange his blog. I have no idea if, if I pronounced his name correctly. It's actually Norwegian, but it's got like two French names inside his, his name, so I'm guessing. Hopefully I didn't butcher it too much. He came up with the official term, uh, persistent bit partitioned vector tree. So, I have decided I'm just going to call it the Hickey tree from now on, <laughs> because that's too much of a mouthful. Uh, anyway, the Hickey tree is very simple, actually. Um, this is a Hickey tree with uh, um, one element in it and a branching factor of four, which is two bits. Are we agreed on that, by the way? You know binary, yes. So uh, in order to represent numbers from zero to three, that is four numbers, we need two bits. And basically, this is a tree as you can see. And we've decided on a branching factor of four for my examples here. So each node can have four children. And so basically, I'm going to try and explain to you how we add to the end of this list. Because the property of, of the, the Hickey tree is that adding to the end is efficient. And lookup, as we're going to see, is efficient. So basically, we just fill the node until it runs out of space. This is basically just like appending to an array so far. And when we do, we add a level. We basically add a root to this tree. And then we pop on a new uh, child node and start filling that instead. And we can keep going until this is a, a hickey tree of 21 elements. It's got um, a depth of basically three levels. We obviously number them from zero to two. And so the idea here is that level zero contain the first two bits, the, the least significant two bits of the index that you're supposed to look up. Level one would contain the next two bits, and level two would contain um, the top two bits. 
and we've got indexes up to 20, which means how many bits do we actually need to represent that? It should be, I mean, given that you have the tree here, it should be um, possible to calculate. Given a height of, of three, it should be three times two. Two being the number of bits that you need to index a single node, which means six bits. So I believe you only need five bits to get to 21. But I do actually have a diagram for this because I wanted to demonstrate how you do lookup. And so if you're going to look up index 18, I've put that in, in binary for you up there. And we basically just take the, the six digit binary number and chop it up into three pieces of, of two bits each. So the top one, that's zero one, that's, what's that in binary? I want to hear you say one, come on. <laughs> right, and so index one in that array, starts at zero, remember, is the one that starts in, at, at index 16. And the next one is zero. So that's index zero in the next trial node down. And the next one is 10, which is what in decimal? Two. Uh, and that would be index two over there, so that's Counting from the left, we find that that is indeed node 18. So what was the time complexity of that lookup? It's logarithmic. And as I said, in Clojure's actual implementation, the, the width of each node is 32 rather than 4, which means that for most imaginable operations, the, uh, the actual logarithmic time is going to be like 2 or 3 for operations um, at worst. It's really efficient for, for actual lookup. Um, so I'm going to try and implement that now. This is the fun bit. How much time have I got? I think 25 minutes. 22. I'll type quickly. That means I actually might not be able to type out the, um, the cool bagwell bits at the end. But we are, oops. We are definitely going to try and implement the, um, the Hika tree. So I've, I've gotten started here. I've got the number of bits in each node. And I use that to calculate the, uh, the branching factor, just to verify. Width is indeed 4. And I've got a bit mask uh, for the, uh, the bit chunks, which should be 3, which is, you might know, uh, binary 1-1, one, one, meaning um, 2 bits. And I got a function index 4, which should get me the index inside a node at a particular le level for the index I'm looking up. So 5, oops, that means that's a level 1 list. That gets us 1, 6 should be... One, I'm surprised. Everything is one. No, that's zero. <laughs> what? Oh no, sorry, this is for level one. I'm, I'm being silly. I was expecting the level zero values. Five, six, and, and five. This should be zero, one, and two. Right. So the bitwise arithmetic works. We don't really have to worry about that from now on. Um, I'm going to show you what a vector should look like. So I said JavaScript, but I'm actually using TypeScript just because these types actually uh, help me illustrate what I'm doing, I think. So we want to store the size of the vector. We want to store the height of the tree because we need to know where to start walking. And we need the root of the tree, which is going to be a tree node type, which I'm going to define as simply a list of any, because types are so complex. Um, and to illustrate, I am going to actually just hard code a list. I'm going to do, I think, a list of six elements, just counting up. That would be size six and 
given that we can fit four into um, a leaf node, that means we've got a level of one, which incidentally means um, this is the, the number of the top uh, level of the tree. So level one means that the tree has, has a, a height of two. And the root node is a list. And given that it's a parent node, it should have two lists inside it. One, two, three, four, and five and six. Are you still with me on this? This is what the tree should look like, yes? As nested lists. The first one is, is full up. I mean, I haven't encoded this in, in types because this is TypeScript, not Haskell. But the, um, the, the assumption here is that the list only ever goes up to width, which is four in, in length, because that's the maximum size of a node. So just going to check that that works. So this is what the list is, is going to look like. I'm going to write a function that creates an empty list. I call it make. And that should just return something similar, size 0, level 0, root, empty list. And let me just move this up a bit. Um, so I'm going to try and implement lookup now. Lookup takes a vector and an index inside the vector, which is a number, and oh sorry, and it returns any, which would be the value that we are looking up, whatever type that might have. And I'm going to write a recursive function for that, which I'm going to call lookup tree starting with the root node and the top level and the index. And lookup tree is the simple bit. Node, level, and index, I said. Going to forgo the types here, just because they take up so much space on screen. So first, I need to calculate the, um, the index at the level I'm looking at. And that's what the index for function up there was for. And if I'm at level zero, that would be if I'm looking at a leaf node. That means I've found my value already. I can just return the value uh, at that index inside the node. If I'm not, I'm going to have to uh, find the next child node down. That would be calling myself again with the child at index i. You're with me on the index i, yes? That's, that's the, the bits that I've picked out using the index for function of the index. <coughs> and I look at the next level down, and I pass the index in again. That should be it. It's actually that simple, doing lookup. This is like no code at all. Obviously, this is not doing bounds checking. Actually. JavaScript also help us with that because the the convention obviously for for um, look at looking up a um, value that isn't there an, an index that's out of bounds is just to return undefined, which is what should happen here as well. In a more sensible language, you'd actually want to handle index out of bounds. But so we still got the test. So let's try and look up something in test. What index should I pick? Five. I mean, this isn't five, OK. <laughs> this is going to be fairly straightforward. Actually, um, because I, I started the list at one rather than zero, this should basically be index plus one, meaning six, if this works. It does. Let's try and test the edge cases. So four would be the first element of, of the second leaf node. Seems to work. Three should be the last element of the first leaf node, which is four. And zero is one. And 10 should be type error. Ah. TypeScript is slightly 
better at, better at this than... Uh, why, why is that a type error? Oh, no, that's a runtime type error. Right. Um, undefined does not have an index. Oh, that's cool. You live and learn about JavaScript every day. OK. So that's lookup. But I've got this pre-made list, and I can't actually construct lists that aren't empty so far. Actually, did I test the make function? That's an empty list. That's cool. So I think I might want to do um, push to back, yeah? That seems like the single most useful um, operation I can implement, implement at this point. So that would be push, takes a vector, and a value, type any value, and should return a new vector, because we are doing persistent data structures after all. So the new vector should be the same as the previous vector, except with an element appended to the back. So this was a bit tricky because, well, it's not as straightforward as a lookup because while we are still going to be using a recursive function just walking down the, uh, the end of the tree, uh, we need to deal with the case where a node is full and we can't append to it. And I'm going to do that basically by returning a JavaScript object that looks like this, simply enough. I mean, the function here should, should normally just be returning uh, the updated node. But in, in the case of the node being full, we need to signal that by using some convention. And I'm just picking this one. The idea then is that you have to create uh, a new level for the tree. But actually, let's, let's leave the top level push for later. I just want to before it gets too complicated. I want to show you the recursive function. Uh, node, level, and it will need value. So I'm basically just calling it uh, vec.root, vec.level, and value, right? Return. Obviously, I also need to handle the full condition at this point, which I'm going to get back to. Because this is where it gets slightly complicated. Now, if level is zero, that means we've found a leaf node. And if it actually has room, that's no problem. We just append the value. And to do that, we need to do a copy of the list with the value appended. So I'm using some fancy new JavaScript ES6, 7, something syntax to do that. This basically copies node and adds value at the end. Because we don't actually want to just push something at the end of node. That would be a mutable operation, and those are very, very bad. <coughs> OK, so that's the easy case. For the less complicated one, we need to return that, oops, this is full, and leave the handling of that to the caller. Now, if we are not at level zero, this is when we have to handle that. But first, we need to walk down the tree. So we find the last node. Uh, that would be node dot length minus one. So that's uh, the last child node of the node that we're looking at. Push tree. Level minus one, and value. So that's the recursive call. And if result has own property full, that means we couldn't push because it was full. We need to create a new node for it. If First of all, if we don't have a space for that in our current node, we have to, actually, we can just return result here. Or is that like unreadable? I'm going to do this. And, and let our parent handle that again. Uh, if not, it's very simple. We just do the node thing, except we have to create 
a new node for the value. Wait, what? It's not that simple, is it? Because we don't know that we are actually, um, that this is gonna be a leaf node. We actually need to create a, fu a function here. to create a node with as many parents as we need to reach the right level. So that's, uh, that's a simple function. If level is zero, just return value, else return recursive call value. And if you're wondering, I literally just spotted this bug in, in the code that I've written. Apparently I never tested it with um, trees of height more than one. So hopefully this works. That should be a single of level minus one and value. Fingers crossed. Uh, right. Where were we? Now, if it wasn't full, that's very simple. We create a copy of the node And the last element, we overwrite it uh, with the modified trial node. And we return that. Ha, ah, this is getting hairy. So this one is at least not too complicated, but we need to actually do the do the same thing here that we did previously. We need to actually see if uh, the operation caused um, a full situation, which means that we have to create a new root node, one level up. So that's fairly straightforward. We'll take the old root as the first element, and we create a single of back level and the value, and we return an updated vector with size is back size plus one, just because we've added one element. And we also increase the level, and we have the new top. Right, and so if it wasn't full, it's a lot simpler. We just return a new uh, vector with back size plus one again. And in this case, the level does not change. And root is the result of pushing to the root. Okay, ah, uh, what? Level, I got a, what? Oh, that should be a, a colon. Why didn't you tell me? Are you not paying attention? Wow, that doesn't compile at all. What? The else part of single. What? Is that not right? Oh, good spot. What? It's uh, like this, obviously. <laughs> but something else is wrong. I knew this would happen. Wow. String match is not a function, the compiler says. That's encouraging, isn't it? Let's just try and take this out and see if it compiles now. Yeah, sort of. That means that the, there's a typo somewhere. Can you see it? Okay, you know what? I've actually typed all this out. I'm going to cheat. <laughs> because I totally got the working code right here. 
We don't have time to mess, uh, mess around with this. And also, I'm going to copy the make count function, which I'm going to need. So let's just replace all of this with the correct code. And it's, I, I swear to you, it's exactly the same thing. <laughs> it's just it doesn't have that one typo I couldn't see. Now it works. You see, it, it's, it's the stuff that I typed. So uh, let's try the push to, to my test. Let's push a value lol, because why not? Ah, that seems to work. So that will be one, two, three, four, five, six as previously, and lol right at the end. Um, so this is a bit awkward, because in my REPL, I can't actually uh, store intermediate values. So I have to like, nest these to add more. <coughs> WTF. That's size 8, but this is like, actually where it gets interesting. Because now it, the end node here is going to overflow. BBQ. And indeed, it has created a new node there. And so I made this make count function just to test really big lists. And so it should basically, if I call uh, make count of four, it should create a list with numbers from one to four. So eight should create one with two nodes, Tw 12 should be three nodes, 16 should be four nodes, and the root node is full now, right? So if I go to 17, or actually let's, let's do 21, like in, in the, the diagram I showed you, it should now actually increase the level, yeah? We're, we're agreeing on this because with a level of one, the, the most values you're going to fit in is 16. Whoop, level two. And we've got the root nodes. And we've got the single node with 21 right at the end. Right. So I should probably talk very quickly now. How much time? Right. <laughs> we have no time. So very, very quickly. Um, the problem with this, obviously, is that we have to um, be able to concatenate and split these lists too, ideally. And we can't do that. Because uh, the prop a property of the, um, of the Hickey tree is that they must always be balanced. Like, like all, all nodes to the left of the last node have to be full. And so we can't simply just say, um, add a, a root node to this, to these two joining them together, or just sort of try and merge them. We have to actually take all the elements of the right-hand uh, tree and actually copy them, push them one by one to, to the first one. And that's linear time. That's not acceptable. And I'm not going to implement that. So basically, the timings for the Hickey tree, to summarize, push to the end is, is log k n, where k is the branching factor. Push to the front would mean recreating a list, which is uh, linear, not good. Look up is very fast. Uh, logarithmic. Concatenation is bad, 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 bad. And split is equally bad. So, why is this slide here? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 sorry. <laughs> uh, actually, in, in, in Clojure's implementation of this, there's an optimization. Because you remember, uh, push to back was logarithmic. And what Clojure actually does is it keeps the, the final node in a separate tail node that you don't have to walk down the tree to find. That would be like the last node that goes on the tree. Until it's full, it actually doesn't go in the tree at all. When it's full, it's just appended as the last node, and we create a new tail that we keep ad adding to, which means that we have to revise the timing. That actually means that push to end is 01 am amortized with uh, log n worst case, which is very acceptable even so, in all fairness. And now in like minus two minutes or something, I'm going to try and explain to you. Here's a dog, by the way. Um, and that's not interesting. I'm going to try and explain to you how uh, the relaxed radix balance trees work, which was supposed to be the point of my talk. But I figured just implementing a simple data structure would be more fun. I'm 
going to dash through this anyway. Hopefully it takes only like a minute or two. I know you all want to go to the sauna, but hey. So basically, Phil Bagwell strikes again. He took uh, Rich Hicker's implementation and he actually removed this restriction that the trees always have to be always balanced to the left. Always have to be every node but the last node have to be full by just adding this little table of how long each node is. So this is a, a list of length 11, essentially. But you notice the first one is only three, whereas the other two are, are the maximum four. And that table there um, tells us that this is in fact true. So it changes the lookup mechanism a little bit. Interestingly, you can still do the, the bit thing, but the bit thing might be a little bit off. So you'd think that looking up the, an index here would be uh, linear time, yes? But actually, if you do uh, the, bit, the bit thing, uh, chunking up the index and, and, and picking out the right bits as previously, you would most likely be within one or two uh, indices in, in, in the lookup table of the element that you're actually looking for. So it's still very, very quick. And it has this interesting property as well that if you want to concatenate these two, now actually you can. And so there's, oops, there's uh, this fairly complicated algorithm in, in Bagwell's paper on this, on how to merge them and, and retain a balanced tree. But as it happens, this tree, these trees are both sufficiently balanced. So literally, I mean, this feels like cheating, but to merge these, I literally just add a, a top level node by them together with an, an, a new updated um, index table. And so I was going to show you at this point how to implement the index lookup with uh, these new constraints, but I am totally out of time. So we're not going to do that. We're just going to review the actual timings of uh, Bagwell's little modification to the Hickey tree. And it's looking really good. Push and pop to both ends, uh, logarithmic time, lookup, is logarithmic time, concat and split, incredibly, also logarithmic time. And I've actually um, implemented these in, in my own Rust library. And the speed gains on, on concat and split compared to even, like there's, I mentioned the basic data structure of, of Rust previously, the, the VEC, which is literally just an array. And it's just blindingly fast. Anything you do to it, even the expensive operations, like the linear time operations, are blindingly fast because everything mostly fits in, in the CPU cache. And it's just like copying sequences of data, which CPUs are hyper-optimized for. But concat and split on my implementation of the, the Bagwell vector are so much faster than even that can hope to be. It's ridiculous. At, at large sizes, of course. Um, so this is actually the most efficient, I believe, um, list-like data, stru data structure that is uh, known to computer science right now. So it's, I mean, it's also incredibly simple compared to some of the stuff that the Haskell community has been producing. <laughs> and I mean, they got some really cool data structures too with slightly different and, and useful properties, but they're a lot more complicated. Like the finger tree, sort of this fractal monstrosity. I wish I had time to show you that one, but absolutely not. I'm just going to move straight to the final slide. So if you want to uh, review these slides, the top URL is the slide deck, including the REPL that you've seen. Uh, I mentioned I wrote this data structure library in Rust. The second URL is for that. And that's my Twitter handle at the end. And I also want to take a moment to mention my personal heroes, Belka and Strelka, the first uh, cosmonauts to actually return from a successful space mission. And here's a reading list. If you want to delve into this, um, we started the basics with the Okasaki book. We got a couple of papers and blog posts about the data structures I mentioned, including the finger trees. Chunked sequences is, is, is another really cool thing that I've used to optimize my vector implementation. And yeah, go wild. Th this should all be Googleable. These aren't clickable but in, in the slides, but you should just be able to type this into Google and find the paper in question. So let's go to the sauna.
Thank you. All right, thanks. Any questions? I think we could do a two or three, maybe. Uh, Unless you're in a hurry. Is the first question going to be, when can we go to the sauna? Yeah. And the second one is, when are we going to the Kekkonen Museum? <laughs> that will be Saturday. on Saturday. <laughs> no questions. <laughs> ah. Oh, yeah, Panu left the building already. <laughs> yeah, so it's up to you. <laughs> so could we just, like, swap this stuff into the closure implementation, the actually, optimization? Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm really curious why nobody's done that yet. Because, I mean, the, uh, the persistent vector implementation is like at least 10 years old now, something like that. And, and there's been like, I mean, even um, immutable JS, which has implemented the Hickey tree, has got some really cool optimizations that you could just basically put straight into uh, cl the closure standard library and see some interesting improvements. And the RRB vector, obviously, is even cooler. And I don't know why that hasn't happened. I mean, you wouldn't need any API change. And, and all the, the fast bits are still going to be just as fast. Just a lot of other bits are going to be even faster. So I don't know. don't know why, why that hasn't been done. You'll have to ask Rich. Yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. I'm getting a bit slow, sorry. You kind of skimmed over the second uh, algorithm, but when you yeah. joined the two trees together, was I right in reading it that the indexes are kind of like offsets? So on the right-hand side, you still oh, had yes. 037. Yeah, I, I had this, this large bit of code that went into that in detail, which I didn't have time for. Uh, actually, yeah, so uh, the, the tables are relative to the start of the node, or the level that you're on. Always, which is how you can actually join them easily. Otherwise, you'd have to recalculate the tables when you do the join. Good spot. All right. Any more? Ah, uh, that's one. One more. That's the last one. <laughs> Mika wants a sauna. Um, does that mean prepend could also be easy? Yeah, or yeah, cheap? yeah. Sorry. I mean, I mean, as long as you've got uh, a pend, like appending to, to vectors, then prepend would obviously be um, at least relatively efficient <laughs> compared to linear time anyway. But um, a lot of optimizations are possible. And, and my implementation of the RRB vector actually has uh, this tail optimization that I, I, I went into detail about uh, on both sides and with two tails on both sides, just, just for, for effect. And so basically what I need to do is implement push full chunks onto the tree on both sides. And, and that's quite efficient, like logarithmic time, obviously, and, and, and not a lot of work at all. So it's, like, it's the perfect data structure, at least if you're just doing sequences. There's nothing it can't do. Like Bagwell is amazing. Great. Thanks, Bodil.